Start of the service. My name's Eric, and I certainly would love to meet you and your family and welcome you here to Journey. So after the service, feel free to come on up and say hello. It would be great to get to know you. So come on up and say hi. We just came off of a pretty amazing message series that we entitled Stranger Things. We talked about heaven and hell, the reality of the fact that there is an enemy, the devil who wants to take us out. We talked about spiritual warfare and how we could defeat the schemes of the enemy. It was a really good series. If you happen to miss it or would like to catch up on any of the messages, go ahead and be sure to download our app at the uh, favorite app store that you might have. It's called Journey Church of Jacksonville. So download that. You could watch it. Um, on your smartphone or online, just go to the Journey Church website and you can catch up on anything you might have missed. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll get into God's word today. Father, we thank you, praise you, and give you glory. We thank you that we could gather together in freedom to worship you today in song, worship you by the giving of our finances and now by the preaching of your word. We pray that these words that I'm about to speak do not fall on deaf ears, but you've made divine appointments, that people are here in the right place at the right time, hear exactly what you want to speak to each of them, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and give us the power to put your word into practice in our everyday lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen. amen. So today, my goal in the words of the esteemed, often revered, and often hated Donald Trump or I'm here to make Thanksgiving great again, in Jesus' name. So, we're gonna, so that's where we're going to go today. We're going to talk about Thanksgiving. We're going to talk about gratitude. You see, over the past few weeks, we talked about some very deep spiritual things that are very much needed if we're to thrive in this life. But today I want to be super practical. I want to flip the coin over and give you the other side of the coin. Both are very much needed to be able to thrive and excel in life. You see, I feel that we live in a generation where oftentimes we take a lot for granted, if we're honest, right? Maybe at times we live just a little bit more entitled than we ought to live. Maybe we live in an age where there's a whole lot of discouragement that goes around too at the same time. The Bible describes the end days, the days that we live in, with some of the following words. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 3, he says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. The book of Romans puts it this way, Romans 128, he says, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do whatever ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy and murder and strife and maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to their parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So these are the days and the age that we live in at times. I see many of these things at work in the world around us, and sadly, even oftentimes in the church, if we're honest, right? We see these things evident, things that shouldn't be. These are not God's desire, but does God give us an antidote in his word? Does he give us a different way of living, a different path of living where Christians can stand out as beacons of light in the midst of this dark and hurting world that's around us? That we as a group of people can show, so demonstrate his love through gratefulness, through loving kindness, through peace, through joy, through the freedom that we have that the world around us would be jealous and want what we have. I believe he can. I believe he gives us something to do, that, uh, to do to put that into practice. You see, those scriptures are pretty terrifying to me when I read them. Are they to you? Like five of you are awake. You guys got to sleep in longer than first service here. Like they were really fired up. This is a charismatic church that you're in, right? I mean, we just talked about all these gifts of the spirit and stuff. Y'all are allowed to like talk back and do good stuff. Come on, Jesus, right? All five of you, other was like, I'm getting out of here. See, like this, what did he just say? So what is one of the antidotes to the age and day that we live in? I believe it is to cultivate a spirit of gratitude. As believers, 
Um, we don't have to wait until Thanksgiving to be grateful. It can be part of our everyday, ordinary experience. It can be part of who we are. There's nothing worse than a Christian that walks around like this, woe is me, oh, I hate everything, this is so bad, everything's terrible, oh, this is going to happen tomorrow, and oh my goodness, is it, you think that's going to attract people to Christianity? No, they're going to run from you like the plague. I mean, like, I don't want to be around that person. There's nothing worse than Christians that are just continually hanging in there. See, I'm here to tell you that in the midst of any circumstance, think of even the disciples and apostles. They were thrown in jail and they were singing spiritual hymns unto God. They were rejoicing in the midst of even the most difficult of circumstances. I'm here to tell you that that is possible, and I'll give you some ideas of how you can put that into practice. I want to start by maybe sharing a little bit of my own story. You see, I was first confronted with my lack of gratitude at around the age of 26. Some people started teaching me a different way of living. They started telling me about some things that should be important in my life, about some things that maybe I was taking for granted that I shouldn't have. They started to shed some new light and new perspective into my life. See, growing up, it was a bit of uh, living in two different worlds for me as I was starting to grow up. It was a, it was a dichotomy of experiences that I had. Um, when I was, I was born to a mom who was just 20 years old at the time that I was born. It was the 1970s. It was not apropos at that time to be a single mom, especially a teenage pregnant mom. That was not something that was popular in those days at all. And uh, she had a hard life before because uh, my grandparents that we came from, um, they were very lower middle class. They had eight children. Can you believe that? Eight kids that all lived in about a thousand square foot house. And back in those days, uh, he was a painter. Um, he painted cars for a living. And a painter does not make all that much money. So he's there trying to support eight kids on a painter's salary. And it was not an easy thing. So my mom was the eldest of them. So the day she turned 18, boom, get out of the house. All the parents said, amen, right? We need to put that back into practice. 18, out, and you're not coming. Goldie, didn't you just turn 18? Yeah, Goldie, you're out. See ya. <laughs> I told you I needed to talk to you earlier. So, like, so you turn 18, boom, out of the house, right? So she's pregnant. Thank God my, my great-grandparents actually kind of stepped in, and they knew how much need she was in. They welcomed her um, into their home, and they were kind of parenting me at that stage because my earthly father was nowhere to be found. He wasn't there to give any money. He never did, not one day, not one cent during the course of my lifetime to help her as a single mom be able to make it. So in the early days, I describe it as there, there was a whole lot of chicken pot pie going on in the house in those days. I mean, that was like the steady diet, microwave chicken pot pie. Um, mom did everything that she could in those early days to mask um, any financial need from, uh, from me. I had no clue that we were poor. I mean, I really didn't. Uh, she, she managed to um, get a job where we had a small apartment, and she did the very best that she could to demonstrate love to me, and I had no sense that we were struggling in any way, shape, or form because she always did the best that she could to love on me. Um, life began to change around the time that I was five years old. She met a man named Dan. Um, Dan came from the other side of the tracks. Dan came from a wealthy family. He owned a large business, and they ended up courting each other for many years. Um, they ended up getting married when I was 13 years old. He adopted me into his own home at the age of 13. He loved me as if I were his own son. He showed me what it meant to be a father, and he was very good to us, and he was th uh, a man of means. So in many ways, we went from eating chicken pot pie to eating steak at times, you know. So it wasn't a little orphan Annie kind of story, you know, but it was a little bit like that. I went from one world to another world. So there's moments in my life where I really remember my roots, where I say, man, I remember what that was like. I remember that. And there's other times where I really take life for granted and the things that came in my teen years and other times when we were a little bit older um, because of the means that he had, that it, I took a lot of those things for granted and I didn't always respect those. I, I lived with more entitlement than maybe I should. 
At the age of 13, I married a very poor decision that would lead to a lot of heartbreak over the next 13 years. Um, I smoked pot for the first time when I was 13 years, and I happened to have in my sinful DNA and my genes a proclivity towards addiction. So that one day turned into 13 years that led me to a place of hardcore cocaine addiction, hardcore drug addiction that almost cost me my family, almost cost me everything in my life. So those next many years, there were moments of wonder, and then there were many, many moments of pain because of what I was suffering through. So that brings me back to kind of where I started at the age of 26. So from 13 to 26, there were a lot of great moments that happened along the way. But then at the age of 26, I found myself where Mary Jo and my parents confronted me and said, you've got a serious problem and you need to go into a treatment center and you need to begin to go get some help. It was not something that I really wanted to hear at that time, but at the same time, God was at work in my heart and I had been crying out night after night, Lord, help me, Lord, deliver me, Lord, set me free. And that was the day he began that process. It was a rather humiliating process at first. It was something that I did not want to succumb to, but today I look back on with some gratefulness for what had happened. So at the age of 26, I end up finding myself in a treatment center and um, you know, I started having thoughts that were both good and thoughts that were bad. It was one of the lowest places in my life and I ended up in this county run facility there were homeless people that were sitting in beds next to me that were part of it. There were crackheads that were there with me. At that time, that was the popular drug. There were real drug addicts that were there with me. So I entered those rooms as this cocky yet broken guy. I entered those rooms with a sense of entitlement. I was better than those junkies that were sitting around me. In fact, I wasn't homeless. I owned a condo. Oh, yeah, I, I was better than them, was I not? I was not at all grateful to be there. I was better than these people. Or was I? In fact, I was just like them. Addiction and sin is no respecter of persons. It crosses all economic boundaries. It doesn't care who you are. The devil wants to take you out. He does not care. Addiction is a terrifying and debilitating disease called sin that affects every single one of us. Maybe your thing was not drugs or alcohol addiction, but we all fall prey to some sort of sin in our life that wants to keep us in bondage and keep us from living the best life that Jesus would have for us, right? I do want to encourage you that if you are struggling in this area of your life, there is hope. There's freedom. You can overcome this. You can recover. You can recover from a seemingly... Um, impossible state of mind and being where you can have a life that is something beyond anything you could have ever hoped for or dreamed for or imagined. We have a group that meets right here in this very building on Friday nights at 7 p.m. We'll be here even after Thanksgiving this week that if you're a family member of a loved one who's struggling or maybe you're the one in the struggle or maybe you're not struggling and you've overcome it and you can help bring hope and light to somebody else, I would encourage you to be here on, sun, on, on Friday nights at 7 p.m. Man, it's a hard group to keep together. Addicts are a hard bunch of people. You know, so pray for those people that uh, not only need to be there, because there's a whole bunch probably in this very room that need to be there, but recoveries for people who want to be there, and God has to do something in their hearts to get them to that place to move from need to want, and thankfully that's part of what he did in my life at that time. So when I got in there, they started to talk to me about this subject of gratitude and gratefulness. I'm like, yeah, I'm real grateful to be here. Yeah. What am I grateful for? They said I needed to begin to cultivate a heart of gratitude if I wanted to be successful. They talked to me about things that seemed trivial like gratitude lists, about how one day I would look back and even be grateful for my addiction. At first, I thought they were crazy. What do I have to be grateful for? My wife wants to leave me. I'm completely broke. I was a hardcore cocaine addict. I was stuck in a treatment center. They said, yeah, but you're alive. Yeah, you're not in jail. Your wife has not left you yet. You're actually sober right now, and you've been sober for like 90 days for the first time in 13 years. And if you remain sober, you can have a beautiful hope for a future life with some great things set before you. There is much to be grateful for. In the first service, people clapped at that particular part. You guys are still sleeping. So then God brought to my remembrance things like, I got to coach you guys. It's all good. Come on. <laughs> Philippians 4, 4. God reminded me of verses like this. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. 
Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. He says, rejoice in your current circumstances. Find things to be grateful for even when it seems like there's nothing to be grateful for because I'm telling you there is so much to be grateful for. Pray to God with thanksgiving on your lips. Do not be anxious for anything because your God is the God of the universe who loves you and cares for you, who died for you, who's got your back. It says if we put these things into practice, a peace that will surpass all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now we've talked a lot in previous weeks and all my charismatic friends in here are so fired up that we're talking about binding and loosing, about taking spiritual authority, about pleading the blood of Jesus Christ. All those are very, very, very good things, right? We need to put them into practice, but if we do so without a heart of gratitude, it nullifies a lot of the power and the other stuff that we've been talking about, right? See, the other side of the coin is that there's some things that are just defeated with a still small voice. When the enemy's trying to bring discouragement our way, and we look at things and say, well, you're not going to discourage me today. I'm going to have a heart of encouragement. Dude, I sound a little bit like Joel Osteen today. Come on, Jesus, right? <laughs> I mean, but there's parts of that theology that are important and true and right, right? I mean, we have to approach things at times not from a position of defeat, but from a position of thanksgiving and gratitude. There is great power in that that is just as important as pleading all of those other supernatural spiritual things. God does something in both. In verse 8, It describes a new set of thought processes that we do need to put in practice. It says we set aside guilt. We set aside worry. We set aside negativity. See, some of us have what we call in recovery circles stinking thinking. We're focusing on all the negative stuff all the time, and we obsess over it, and we fear over it, and we worry about all the worst outcomes of things all the time, and it debilitates us, and it keeps us focused on all the wrong things instead of how good God is to us and how we have a future and a hope in Him. We need to change the way we think. It says, think on the good things. So when you talk about this concept of a gratitude list, yeah, there's challenges. So it has to be reality-based. And you divide a sheet of paper, and you put it in the left, and you write some of the challenges. And at first, that challenge list might fill up the whole entire sheet of paper. But then all of a sudden, you start to write the things that you're grateful for, and it begins to put things into perspective. And before you know it, the gratitude side is a lot longer than the negative side because God is answering your prayers. He's changing you. He's transforming forming you. He's changing your mind. He's changing your circumstances. So I would encourage you to change your stinking thinking when it is present. That's going to be the only line you're going to remember from the entire service. (laughs) Trust in God. Thank him for his provision. Thank him for his love. Thank him for your salvation. And then your perspective will begin to change. I look back at their comments from those days, and you know what? I found most of them to be true. When I put this kind of a spirit into practice, when I put this concept of an attitude of gratitude into practice, my life began to get a whole lot better. My problems seem a whole lot smaller. And when I don't do that, you might guess what happens. That stinking thinking begins to prevail in my life, and I don't want that to be there. Even one day they said I would be grateful for my addiction. I said, how in the world could that happen? You know, that promise maybe began to take over a year to be realized, but as I stayed sober, as I sought hard after God, guess what? My marriage was restored. My finances were restored. My career was restored. I had a career change and became a pastor. God has used my story numerous times to help other people come to know him as their Lord and Savior and have other people come to a place where they found sobriety and recovery in Jesus as well. So yes, I am grateful for what I went through. Was it a hard time? Yes, no doubt. 
But man, looking back on the story, God uses the most difficult moments of our life when we overcome them to ultimately bring hope to others. So share your story. God wants to use your story to impact others. See, I believe God wants that for your life too. So I would begin to ask you a few questions that I'd ask you to contemplate before we leave. Where are you lacking gratitude? Where are you focused on the things that you shouldn't be focused on? Where are you focused on the negative rather than on the things of God? Where are you acting way too entitled? Are you willing to begin to look at those things from a different perspective? There was a song back then, an oldie but a goodie, that really helped me during that season. Maybe it'll help us today. This is how I'm going to close in just a minute. I'm going to tell you the story behind a song called Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. It's older than many of you in this room, but it's a good one. It was very popular at the time that we got saved. The story behind the song is this. It says, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. It says, In Uzbekistan, a country just north of the war-torn land of Afghanistan, a group of Uzbekis were singing a Christian song that they had recently learned. This is an unusual sight in a unique country. One photographer said, Uzbekistan, the crossroads of Asia, is an elusive mixture of Soviet industrial atheism, Islam, and the Orient. Crossing the something I can't pronounce desert in Lada, a Russian-made car that left a lasting impression, the group is singing Henry Smith's Give Thanks, which has traveled from America to this extraordinary place. I'd ask somebody to get Adam, bring him onto the stage. He's going to sing the song for us in just a moment. Henry Smith Jr. was born in Crossnore, North Carolina in 1952. Of the nearly 300 songs that he has written, only one has been published. That's right, only one. But what a song, what a meteor. I was delighted to get to know the following story just as it was relayed to me. In 1978, in an apartment in Williamsburg, Virginia, I wrote the song, Give Thanks. Shortly thereafter, my wife Cindy and I sang the song at our church. We repeated it a number of times over the period of a couple weeks. A military couple who attended our church for a while carried the song back with them to Germany. As far as I know, that's how the song got to Europe. I did a lot of traveling before it was actually published. In 1986, eight years after the writing of the song, a friend brought me a cassette tape and said, listen to this song and see if you've ever heard it. After listening to the selection, I said, I wrote that song. My friend has ordered the tape from a music company and Give Thanks was listed on the cassette label as Author Unknown. I called the company and told them I had written the song. Their response was, good, we have been trying to find you. Since then, more than 50 recording companies have produced Give Thanks and it has been published in a number of hymn books. A few years later, the Smiths attended a live integrity recording music session in Washington, D.C., conducted by Don Moen. During that session, Moen played a recording to the audience with Henry's song being sung in the Russian language. Henry said, my wife and I began to weep. We were overwhelmed to hear my song being sung in that language. Moen had no idea that they were in the audience. Give Thanks continues to be one of the most popular songs during the Thanksgiving season. Used in churches worldwide, it is easy to understand why so many people love this song. One only has to carefully listen and examine the lyrics. Would you do that, just that? Would you rise with me and worship one more time? And give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. And give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son, and give thanks with a grateful heart, and give thanks to the Holy One, and give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son, and now let the weak say, I am strong, let the poor say, I am rich, because of 
what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the got published what in your life maybe you're thinking of right now that you've tried to overcome and maybe you've tried to overcome it 300 times and you just haven't been able to maybe you like me have been crying out when you lay your head to bed and say Lord help me not to do this again tomorrow I believe that today could be the day of your deliverance I believe that today it could be the day that God brings real change into your life maybe it starts with this cultivation of that spirit of gratitude. So some of you might be here and you've been trying to overcome some stuff 300 times. You think you're never gonna get over it, but I'm here to tell you God's presence is here and I believe he wants to break through and I believe he wants to bring some of you a hope that you never could have imagined. If that's you, everybody just bow your heads and close your eyes for a second. Is, is that you? If it is, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand real high and I'd like to pray for you. I see your hand and yours and yours. Thank you, Lord and your hand in the back. Thank you, Lord, and yours, and yours. Thank you, Lord. Hands all over the place. A couple more questions. Is God speaking to you right now that maybe you haven't been living with an attitude of gratitude? You've been looking at the negative and all kinds of things instead of being grateful for what God's already provided for your life? You know you need to repent of that a little bit. You need to change your way of thinking. Maybe you've been walking around with a little bit of a sense of entitlement on some things where you certainly shouldn't. If that's you, nobody's looking around. Would you do me a favor and just put your hand up real high? You need to break that sense of entitlement and gain a new sense of gratitude. I see yours and yours and yours and yours. Yours all over the place. Hands up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for moving today. I want to say one thing to those of you who might be struggling in that area, especially before we do our last request. If you raised your hand to that one in particular, would you, after this service, go in the back and please do me a favor and help with the delivery of those baskets? I'm telling you, it'll bring perspective to your life. It'll change you. If anybody's struggling in that area at all, please, please, please use this as an opportunity to allow God to work through you and change you and being a blessing to others. My final one, maybe you're here today and you wouldn't call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ, but as you've heard of his great love, as you've heard of this spirit of thanksgiving and all that you've experienced today, you're like, man, I wanna become part of God's family. That's the reason we conduct these services with the hope that some would surrender their lives to him. Or maybe you are a believer and your salvation is secured, but you know that today needs to be a day of rededication. You need to put him first and you need to live for him. So if today's the day you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to God, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand up really high so I know who I'm praying with. I see your hand, ma'am, and yours in the back, sir. Thank you, Lord. Here's what I'd ask you to do. I want you to be bold. I know I did some of that with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, but if you want a breakthrough, sometimes you just gotta go for it. 
So if you want to get freedom in these areas that I've been talking about, I would love to shake your hand. I promise I'll do nothing to embarrass you, but I'd love to shake your hand. I'd love to pray with you, and we'd love to give you some next steps. If that's you and you raised your hand to any of those things, would you come on up to the front? I'd love to shake your hand. Give them a little glory. If you raised your hand, come on up here. God is moving. God is moving. Come on, Lord. Hallelujah, sister. Glad you're here. Come on up. God bless you. Glad you're here. God bless you. Stay right here. God bless you. So glad you're here. We want to pray for you guys. Come on up. There were others. Come on. If you want to get free, 300 times 300, you got to get up sometimes. God bless you guys. Come on, Journey. Give them a little bit bigger round of applause. How you doing? God bless you. So glad that you're here today. Come on up here. All right. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful today. We are grateful today that you are at work, that you continue to change lives, that you continue to challenge us to repent where repentance is necessary, but also that you give us great joy and a hope for the future. So I stand in the gap and praying with those who have come up here today. And Lord, we just publicly declare first and foremost that Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on the cross and rose again that we might have life and have it abundantly, Lord God. You are our king. You are our Lord. And from this moment forward, we will serve you and live for you all the days of our life. We thank you for an abundant life in your spirit that you have defeated hell, death, and the grave, and that nothing can stand in your presence. And Father, we pray for those who are at the front or maybe those who were scared to come up front that have been uh, struggling with that 300 times thing in their life that they can't seem to overcome, that sin that they struggle with, that they can't overcome on their own. And Lord, we ask you by the power of the Holy Spirit to give them the power to overcome, that you would bring deliverance today, that you would bring hope today, that you would bring freedom today, that you would bring forgiveness today, that you would set them on fire to live for you all the days of their life, Lord God, that they would never look back to that thing that has so ensnared them, but they would look forward to the goodness and the glory of what you set before them. Would you change all of our hearts and all of our attitudes? Would you help us to cultivate a spirit of gratitude? Would you bind stinking thinking and cast it far from us in the name of Jesus that we could live for you all the days of our life? In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Give them one more round of applause. Before you go back to your seats, there's some around you who would like to give you a little bit more information. Don't head right back. They'll give you a little bit of information. Don, Stephanie, others. Give them one final round of applause.